I'll turn it over to you. Welcome, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, I really look forward to doing a webinar. It's a little bit higher tech thing than I've done before, so bear with me as I go through this. I've been practicing law so long that when we used to cut and paste, we really meant cut and paste, uh, literally on paper. So now we're in the computer age. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the uh, amendments to the Fair Labor Standards Act regulations, the federal wage and hour law. Uh, the, the changes are actually relatively simple, but they also have going to have significant impact. Uh, the one thing that, that you may want to keep in mind is that as uh, ministries, you may not be covered or your organizations may not be covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act in total, but I think it's important to know that uh, what the law is and to comply with it because there are areas where it can be, where even uh, religious nonprofit organizations can be challenged. Uh, first, I want to cover uh, what the current uh, situation is under the exemptions, and that's what we're really talking about here, are some uh, statutorily defined exemptions from the minimum wage and overtime requirements of the, of the law, and uh, go over what the current law is, and then uh, give you a heads up on what the changes are or will be as of December 1, and then maybe give some tips on how you might transition from where we are now to where you need to be uh, as of December 1. Uh, in terms of where we've been, uh, the Wage and Hour Law, Fair Labor Standards Act, which I had a partner one time tell me that there's nothing fair about the Fair Labor Standards Act, but it was passed back in 1938 during the Depression. And really the intent of the law at that time was not only to raise uh, income of working class Americans, but it was also designed to allow more work sharing. In other words, penalizing employers for working employees overtime so that they'd be incented to hire more people. And it set up uh, laws concerning minimum wages and overtime, equal pay, and uh, record keeping, where those who aren't exempt uh, have to record or the employer has to record hours worked and pay accordingly. Uh, nearly all employers are covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, any enterprise with over half a million in annual revenue is covered. And then even aside from that, and this is where we could get into some situations, even with a religious nonprofit, is that somebody can be covered individually if they have a sufficient connection with interstate commerce. Uh, I don't want to get into too much constitutional law, but for a law for the federal government to pass a law that cover, it covers everybody, uh, they have to show a connection with interstate commerce. Uh, in the employment context, uh, that can be anything from using cell phones and, and computers that are built in out of state, uh, transmitted interstate, and there's all sorts of things we use in our daily activities that involves in some way interstate commerce. So it doesn't take much to cover a whole lot of folks. Um, Basically, I said there are really two main components to the wage and hour law. One is minimum wage, the other is overtime. Uh, minimum wage is something that uh, currently under federal law, 725 an hour. You know, you've heard a lot of noise during the campaigns about going up to $15 an hour, uh, except in some uh, uh, limited jurisdictions that hasn't happened. But a lot of states have passed their own minimum wage laws. And you can see here what some of the different minimum wages are. And even, uh, you know, there are uh, missing from this is California, which has a $10 an hour minimum wage that's going to go to $10.50 an hour on January 1. Uh, Ohio is going to go up to $8.15 an hour January 1. Florida is going to go to $8.10 an hour on January 1. And then you've got different uh, municipal jurisdictions that have even higher minimum wages. But uh, under federal law, if you're not under one of these specific state laws or municipal laws, 
the federal uh, minimum wage is seven twenty five an hour. Now, the uh, when when you somebody is working in this country, uh, if they work beyond forty hours in a work week, they're entitled to overtime compensation at the rate of one and a half times or what we call the regular, whatever their average rate is, uh, unless employee is exempt and the, there are some exemptions that have been issued uh, that have uh, that that tell you what positions don't have to worry about minimum wage or overtime and and that's the, the, the main one by the way I hear some of the background if somebody uh, is not on mute they want to put their on mute but we've got uh, Basic exemptions under the, there are a number of different exemptions, but they're very common ones. And the ones we're going to focus on today are what we call the white collar exemptions. And that's uh, folks that are in executive capacity, those in administrative positions, and those who are in professional positions. And I'm not going to get into detail on the duties that have to be under each of these exemptions. Uh, but just know that the duties uh, under these exemptions remains unchanged. The new regulations do not have anything to do with uh, the, the, the duties test under these exemptions. And as you can see on the current slide, for each exemption, there are two tests that have to be met. One is the duties test which, like I said, remains the same. The other is the salary test, a guaranteed salary. And one thing that is very important, at least from a legal standpoint, and really practically for employers, is that unlike most cases where the plaintiff has the burden of proof in a court, when you try to assert one of these exemptions, it's the employer that has the burden of proving both of these tests. So that everybody's presumed to be non-exempt, and then the employer has got to prove the exemption. So these things are often challenged and, and sometimes uh, successfully. So we've got two tests for each exemption. And then we also have, as I mentioned before, some overall coverage issues. Some nonprofits are exempt as organizations. Uh, but if the uh, nonprofit engages in any activity which could be perceived to compete with any private sector entity, uh, that, ex that exemption is lost. Also, as I mentioned before, you have situations where individuals might be covered because of their connection with interstate commerce through things like using the telephone, the website, traveling across state line in performing the duties and that sort of thing. But you can have some comfort that as ministries across this country, you have an additional defense if you ever get a wage and hour claim brought against your organization. Uh, that said, I think it's still important to try to comply with the regulations under the Fair Labor Standards Act so that you have more than one defense. Now, with the current regulations uh, under the executive administrative professional exemption there's a guaranteed salary test and that is four hundred fifty five dollars a week which comes to twenty three thousand six hundred and sixty dollars per year that folks who you want to treat exempt not only have to pass the duties test but they have to receive a salary of at least that amount that is not subject to being reduced based on the quality or quantity of work they perform during the work week. It's a guaranteed salary. There's some exceptions to paying the guaranteed salary, but very few. So sometimes an employer can lose an exemption if they dock the employee's pay uh, for things that aren't, you know, aren't appropriate under the regulations. Basically, though, there's that basic salary test. And then there's the duties test which again, I'm not going into great detail, but it looks at what the individual's primary duty is and you know how that compares to uh, what they do in their other uh, work time. Basically, executive exemption is a position that oversees, uh, supervises two or more other 
full-time employees or full-time equivalent employees and exercises independent judgment and discretion in their job. Administrative exemption is a, an individual who may not supervise others but has a decision-making authority on matters of significance where they exercise their independent judgment and discretion. And then the professional exemption is one that applies to people like lawyers and doctors and CPAs mm -hmm. and those with an advanced uh, degree beyond just a bachelor's degree, uh, and they use that expertise in performing their duties. So they each have a separate test. Those tests aren't changed or won't be changing. Uh, nothing's proposed to change there. Um, and then we've got another category where you have a little bit lighter duties test if the uh, current uh, salary of the employees or compensation of the employees at least a hundred thousand dollars a year uh, that's just a, a way of having an easier test but I can't imagine in the nonprofit world anybody making uh, more than a hundred thousand dollars that also wouldn't clearly be an exempt executive uh, employee uh, it's just uh, it's not the way nonprofits work by paying that much so uh, anyway, that's uh, that's kind of where where we are, and where we're going is uh, what we need to pay attention to. Because even though this slide says future, the future is almost now. December one is uh, barely a little more than a month away, and that's when these new regulations kick in into effect. You may have heard through the news media that there's legislation to delay it. You may have heard that 21 states and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have filed a lawsuit to delay it, but none of that, I don't think you can count on any of that uh, taking place before December 1, and if any legislation is passed, you can be assured that the current administration and the president would veto that. Now, they issued their final rule back in May, so we've had this for a while, uh, to go into effect uh, December 1, and really what they did is they adjusted the salary requirement under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And, you know, you, you might ask, why did they do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One, it's political. This is an election year. Uh, the president is uh, finishing up his term of office and I think probably uh, wanted to go out with uh, uh, some adjustment to the, to the guaranteed salary. Uh, in my career, the, the salary level was very low for decades until 2004 when it was raised from $250 a week to $455 a week. Uh, we're only a little bit more than a decade away from the last time, and it's more than doubling. So it's, it's while it's not a complicated issue, it's one that you can see has a, has, will have a tremendous impact. Uh, and also one of the things that's happening in this is that previously there was never any indexing for future automatic increases. This, these new regulations have that feature. Uh, so what is the change? Well, uh, the one that uh, is going to affect everybody is that 455 per week uh, is now 913 or will now be 913 per week or an annual salary of 47,476. So if you have executive, administrative, or professional employees who are making at least that, uh, nothing's going to change. But we have a lot of uh, entities, nonprofits, retail <clears throat> that tend to have lower overall compensation where there are a number of employees who make more than the current minimum salary but are less than this level <clears throat> who will become non-exempt even if their duties don't change at all uh, just because of the salary increase. Remember, you have to pass both the duties test and the salary test. So even if they pass the duties test, if they don't pass the salary test, they're going to be considered non-exempt. There is a little bit of a flexibility for employers that pay according to a, uh, a uh, with, with commissions, part of the salary can be made up in commissions, but I don't think that's relevant here, and I've advised clients to ignore that, uh, that issue. And then the salary test for highly compensated goes up even more. It goes up from 100 to $134,000 a year, which, again, 
Uh, not too many nonprofits pay at that level, and if they're paying at that level, it's going to be somebody that's going to be duties-wise exempt anyway. So uh, that's pretty much a non-issue in the nonprofit world. So also, and I mentioned this briefly, is that now the uh, the regulations allow for every three years for this number to be adjusted. If you look back two slides ago, you'll see it looks at the 40th percentile of the lowest uh, region in the in the country of salaried workers, and they're going to use that same benchmark for both the, the guaranteed salary and the highly compensated. They'll use the 90th percentile, but now it's going to be every three years. The first uh, automatic update will be January 1 of 2020. So the you know the Congress or the Department of Labor doesn't have to keep going back to change the regulations to adjust the salary, and that's the first time we've ever seen anything like that. Uh, probably those things won't be as significant as what's happening now with the more than doubling of the salary on one fell swoop. Um, no changes to the duties test, but we want to make sure that. One of the things that we've noticed in uh, looking at uh, uh, these cases or these our clients' situations is it's not that unusual for clients to misclassify employees as exempt when they're really non-exempt. You know, I've had I can't tell you how many times I've had a client tell me, "Well, they must be exempt because we pay them a salary." Well, they've got to have the pass the duties test. And uh, if they don't pass the duties test, they're not going to be exempt no matter how much you pay them. Now, one thing that I guess is some silver lining with these new regulations is that if the employer, if you've misclassified somebody as exempt who should be treated as non-exempt, this gives the employer a, a, a good excuse to make that change to not, you know, treat them as non-exempt without raising any red flag about having done anything wrong in the past and and this isn't just places where there's you know it may be somebody is classified as exempt who may be exempt but it's kind of a gray area uh, again uh, I got to remind everybody that the burden of proof is on the employer so if you're not sure that you can prove the duties test under an exemption you can can cr treat them begin treating those employees as non-exempt right now without making it look like you've done anything wrong in the past because a whole group of employees are going to shift from exempt to non-exempt. Um, and what do you do? You've got you to start uh, you know, looking to making changes if you have people within this uh, uh, 26,000 to 47,000 uh, pay band who you've treated as exempt. Uh, there's a couple of things that uh, you can do uh, one is to see whether the the position would should really be exempt. Like I said, you can fix it. Uh, you can see how close they are to the new exempt salary requirement. If somebody's at forty seven thousand, even you know a very small increase would allow you to take advantage of the new salary test. Uh, but if they're Paid thirty-five thousand dollars a year. You know the budget won't allow adjusting everybody up another twelve thousand dollars to meet the exemption, and it would be un it'd be very costly. It may cause compression problems with people who supervise them, making very little more than they are. Uh, all sorts of things. You could look to see what sort of hours these employees work, and and figure out what the overtime exposure would be. If they're converted to non-exempt, to see what kind of budget impact that had, it could be that yeah, they they're not exempt, but they rarely ever work more than 40 hours a work week, so it may not be a big issue. Uh, obviously, a big issue is going to be that if they go from exempt to non-exempt, you're going to have to make sure that they accurately record hours worked, because for all non-exempt employees, it's the employer's burden make sure record keeping is accurate and they do that. Um, and I give you, you know, we have an example here that, you know, of, of somebody that currently makes $40,040 a year, you know, you, you have them at a certain amount per week. 
then you just convert that uh, pay to uh, an hourly rate and then time and a half of that for working over 40s in the work week. And what the wage and hour regulations do allow employers to do is to just maybe that hourly rate down so that with the overtime, the overall uh, compensation is going to be going to be the same. You don't have to calculate the hourly rate by dividing salary by 40. You can start a little lower than that to where if you account for overtime, they'll be making essentially the same amount. But of course, you'll have to keep track of hours worked. And if they work more overtime, they get paid more. Uh, another alternative, like I said, was to move up the, the uh, manager in this instance to the 47.476 annual salary. Um, but again, that could be overly, overly expensive. Um, and then you can uh, uh, try to try to reduce their salary, but pay them additional overtime to stay within that $770 a week. But you've got to look at it. Other things you can do is to combine positions. You may have two uh, non-exempt positions that you can create one position with a lot more responsibility that pays more that meets the new the new exemption salary and then have somebody report to them that would be pure hourly. Um, besides figuring out what you're going to do pay-wise, compensation-wise, how you're going to account for that, how you're going to do record keeping, you're going to have to communicate with, with staff and managers on what the changes are. I mean, you have to make clear that people that didn't have to record time work now have to and train them how to do that. You're going to have to make sure that managers who never had to uh, watch how their employees recorded time because they didn't record time, you'll have to make sure those managers know what to look for and how to control over time, how to make sure that their employees are accurately recording time work uh, and how they can schedule employees to make sure that overtime is minimized. Uh, you may have to implement overtime policies where people are not authorized to work overtime unless they get advance approval, so to limit the exposure there. A lot of things that uh, maybe employers didn't have to worry about, at least with a certain group of employees, now you're going to have to make sure that those employees are trained and that their managers are trained. Uh, one of the issues we have now with working time is people re working remotely on their computer, their cell smartphones. Uh, doing that sort of thing. All that work time has to be recorded if they're now non-exempt. And of course, you have to make sure they're paid appropriately based on the recorded hours work. So that's some of the things you have to do. Um, you know, you have to uh, consider timing. You know, a lot of times these things can be uh, tied to an annual evaluation or performance review. Now, you're in a situation now where if you're going to make changes, you only have a little over a month to do it. So that may be what drives the changes rather than have some kind of uh, review session. But uh, a review is a good opportunity to communicate these things with employees. And uh, you need to you know, make sure that uh, everybody uh, understands and appreciates the need to do the change and the fact that you know you can always blame the government for making you do this. So if somebody pushes back and say, I want a salary, I don't want anything but a salary, I don't want to go hourly, uh, you say, well, we, we, we appreciate that, but we have to uh, comply with the law. So you'll have morale issues if you make some changes. And of course, you've got to make sure that every three years you look at it again to make sure that er everything is done appropriately. Now, one thing that that, that I have uh, recommended to a number of clients that uh, are faced in a situation where mid-level or lower-level managers, supervisors, and others that would previously fall within an exemption won't is to pay what's called on a fixed salary for fluctuating work week pay plan. And uh, this is a pay plan where you pay a salary, it's a guaranteed salary, just like a uh, exemption, or like an exempt employee would be paid. Uh, it is even more guaranteed than an exempt employee's salary. There are no exceptions to paying the, the full guaranteed salary in a work week. 
Uh, if they work a minute in a work week, you got to pay them the salary. But it really reduces the employer's overtime exposure if there's any kind of overtime with that employee. Basically, what you do is the salary covers uh, all hours worked at straight time, including the overtime hours. So really, the, the salary, the hourly rate for the employee goes down the more they work, their regular rate for computing overtime. Since they've been paid their straight time for all hours work, including overtime, all the employer owes is an additional half time for hours worked over 40 in a work week. And you give an, I give an example, um, you know, and, and, it, and it's perfectly legal to do it that way. It's just there has to be an agreement with the employee to pay that way. It should be a situation where the employee's hours fluctuate. Obviously, if somebody doesn't work overtime, you don't need this pay plan. An hourly uh, rate would be sufficient. And, uh, you know, like I say, you can't, uh, you can't make any deductions from the guaranteed salary. And this is something that, that we uh, have recommended in the, when people in this area between, you know, where they used to be exempt, but now you have to treat them as not exempt we recommend going with this type of pay plan and uh, to, to minimize the overtime exposure. These, these employees still obviously have to record hours worked because you do owe a little overtime when they work over 40 hours in a work week. And I'll give you an example here on this slide. If you've got somebody that's getting paid $20 an hour versus somebody with a fixed salary pay plan at $800 a week, you see at 20 hours you only owe the hourly employee $400 pay. For the fixed salary employee, you owe the fixed salary $800. Uh, if they work any, they get that salary. At 40 hours, it's the same, and that's why I used those, uh, that hourly rate. It's $800 at 40 hours, but at 50 hours, the person paid at $20 an hour gets time and a half for the 10 overtime hours. So time and a half at 20 is $30 an hour times the 10 overtime hours is $300. So for a 50-hour work week, that individual would get paid $1,100, 300 plus 800. Now contrast that to the fixed salary pay plan. Somebody with the $800 salary works 50 hours, you divide the $800 by 50 to get the regular rate for determining overtime, which turns out to be $16 an hour. And that $16 an hour for each of the 50 hours, and you've got just uh, uh, an additional half time, 10 hours, which is uh, $8 an hour for the 10 hours, which is $80. So for that employee under that plan, uh, the employer only owes $880. So you can see that it tremendously avoids any kind of overtime exposure for, for folks that do work over 40 on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, it's going to be a, a lot of cost. You've got to step through and plan the how to convert to this system and uh, take it from there. Any questions? I don't know whether we've got them uh, coming in or how this is. Frank, you want to work this? But yep. uh, that's yep. new regs in a nutshell. All right. Well, at this point, um, I don't have any questions. I'm sure people are absorbing all that information. Uh, so why don't we open it up to questions now? If you have a question, uh, you can either type the question in and I'll give it to Eric, or you can just just uh, just say, "Hey, Frank," and then I'll open up your microphone. Uh, let me get some questions going here. So um, we will we be sharing the PowerPoint later. Uh, this re this uh, session has been recorded, so it will be uh, available to you from. Krista at CCMA. Uh, here's a question from Carmen. Uh, Eric, could Eric bring up the slide that explains the variable salary? Okay, is that the... Uh, Look at that. 
This Magic. you're talking about this, where you have the guaranteed salary. Is that the one? That, is that the one you mean, Car Carmen? Let me open up your microphone. You can just speak directly to Eric. Go ahead, Carmen. Well, there you go, Carmen. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's the one I wanted to see. Hello, Carmen. Yeah, and, and really, this is a uh, uh, we're in the one of the things I didn't mention is that your salary has to be enough. Besides being guaranteed salary, it has to be enough so that when you divide it by all hours worked. So in this example, when you divide 800 by uh, by 50 to get the $16 an hour regular rate, that regular rate has to be at least the minimum wage. So you can't have a fixed salary that's so low and it works so many hours that when you divide the salary by total hours worked, uh, the number falls below the minimum wage. But as long as that's above the minimum wage. All you do is pay an additional half time for hours worked above 40. And there's even a, a coefficient table that the government produces whereby you can easily calculate overtime under this type of pay plan. And remarkably, at 50 hours, the coefficient is 0.1. So anytime somebody works uh, 50 hours, it's only going to be 10% more than their salary. Okay, does that answer your question, Carmen? Or would you like to go yeah, ahead? Could he, could, could he go back? Because I'm a slow reader. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just okay. need to look at it for a little while. Okay. Well, this yeah, will be available is... to you, so you can look at it once uh, Chris has sent you the link also. Go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. And we have, we have, we can send, if somebody would like it, a, uh, the coefficient table, and we have sort of a sample letter that you give to the employee that, that makes clear that their salary is going to cover all hours worked at straight time. That would be great. Eric, if you could send that to Krista, uh, then she can always distribute it to the, those who ask for it. Thank you. I have a question here for you. Uh, Carmen, are you all set? Any other question? Are you all set? Yeah, no, no, I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Uh, we have a question from Christine. Hi, Christine. Let me open up the uh, microphone in case you want to follow up. Christine's asking, we are a small Catholic university with non-exempt student services staff who lead alternative spring break trips for campus ministry. They're on the road with us 24-7 for a week. How can we compensate them? Well, I think if, uh, if they are on the, on the road and they're working, then all that is compensable work time. And if they are consider non-exempt, then uh, you'd have to pay, you know, overtime for any hours over 40 in the work week. Now, you could pay them under the same sort of fixed salary pay plan, but if their hours, you know, if a lot of times they work 10 or 15 hours a week, that would probably be cost prohibitive to pay them a guaranteed salary. Christine, your microphone's open if you have any follow-up. Well, all right, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So, so the question is, what's considered work during that week? I mean, they're not campus ministry employees, first of all. So when they are sleeping, are they uh, sleep? working? Yeah. If, if they're traveling, if, if, now you're getting into some real things kind of complex. Sleep time, if they get at least five hours of in uninterrupted sleep, and uninterrupted sleep up to eight hours is non-compensable. So if they're allowed to get eight hours of sleep or ten hours of sleep, you can uh, take a credit for eight hours that they're sleeping if, if they're otherwise working around the clock on a 24-hour type out-of-town shift type thing. Uh, it, it, if they're out of town and they're just working, you know, from, you know, 16 hours a day, you know, that that is the same thing. I mean, there's only eight more hours in that, that day anyway. But if they're working 12 hours in that day and they just happen to be out of town, you just pay them for the 12 hours. Well, I mean, they're sort of always responsible for the students because they're chaperoning a trip. 
Oh, they're chaperons, so they so they always have some uh, duty, except when they're sleeping, is what you're saying. Right. And then I think you've got to pay for all the time except for the uninterrupted sleep time up to eight hours. You can't take a credit for more than eight hours. Um, and they're, you know, but they can also, if they, they, if they can get breaks of at least a half hour here and there, that can be off the clock too if they're relieved of responsibility. If they're not relieved of responsibility, they're still, uh, that's still compensable work time. Okay, and is is there such a thing as that being simply a volunteer activity that they are doing, or are you not allowed to volunteer for your employer? Well, no, it, it, if it's purely a volunteer thing where they don't get paid at all, I think you're okay. The the uh, the situation I've had come up though with some nonprofits is they start out being pure volunteers and then they pay them something. You know, whether it be, you know, what I've heard called, to, referred to as pin money. Once you start paying them and they can take the position that, that it's, um, you know, that they become economically dependent on what money they get out of their work, then they go from being a volunteer to being an employee and you get into trouble. Now, we're, we're just talking about one week a year when university employees from one department chaperone service trips for another department. So yeah, they're, and, and I, they're, making their, I think, they're making their pay from their own department. Yeah, well, I think that'd be compensable work time. Okay. Okay. All right. And, you know, except for the, and, and it, it could be problematic. Now, uh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, Eric. I didn't, uh, are you ready? You want to move on to the next question, or were you going to finish? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, there are some activities where they may, you know. Remember, I said initially that there are some ministry activities that we may be able to take the position are not covered at all by the wage and hour law. But I think to be careful, you should plan on trying to comply the best you can. Great. Okay, Christine. All right, we'll move on. Jim has a question. What is your experience of applying for a full-time campus minister to have the ministerial exemption because their primary duty is pastoral presence? So let me open up Jim's microphone. It may actually be open. Or Jim, I think, you, yeah, there you go. go ahead. Yes, yeah. I, I think there would 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 likely be an exemption for that type of full time position. A minister position. That's what I'm wondering. Uh, it seems to me a lot of us in campus ministry, um, the previous caller, that has to do with the larger student affairs division, but I suppose that probably at least maybe fifty percent of us listening in on this conversation are just campus ministers and they are people we work with and our primary duty is 24-7 to just be available for the students. Within that then we organize activities and things like that but our primary call is to be available to the students for any pastoral need um, and then I was wondering if you've ever tried to apply for that exemption down in Florida for any ministers, how, how open is the federal government to people beyond explicit clergy doing this? Well, would, would they also be getting at least the, uh, the minimum salary? I mean, how, how are they compensated? Yeah, I would say, I, I don't know across the United States, but I'd say most campus ministers are making somewhere in the 35 to 40 bracket. Yeah, I, I think that the, the real, the test rel relating to uh, whether uh, an activity is engaged in commerce relates to whether or not what that individual is doing is the same type of service that's provided by the for-profit sector. Uh, there's a, a Supreme Court case uh, from years ago where there was a religious foundation that got into trouble because they ran a gift store that sold gifts and candy and that sort of thing. 
and they, the the uh, Supreme Court held because there are for-profit entities that do the same sort of thing that even though their mission is not uh, commerce, they're in, they are indeed engaged in commerce and covered by the wage and hour law. On the other hand, I have represented uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that really don't have a counterpart in the private sector and have argued at least uh, so, six, somewhat successfully that the wage and hour law doesn't even come into play. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be um, a very appropriate argument when it comes to a full-time campus minister. Do you have any idea of the turnaround time once you um, make your case of exemption to the appropriate agency and, and then that agency making a decision about the exemption? Well, what happens is is that you don't just you don't go apply for the exemption. What would happen is that the uh, Department of Labor would uh, investigate, you know, the uh, audit the the entity, and in that audit process, which usually takes about 60 days or so, they would determine whether or not they would assess back wages. Okay. The only other way it would come up is if an individual minister decided they wanted to sue under the wage hour law, okay. <laughs> in which case it would go to a judge and who knows how long it would take to decide it, but uh, I would think that very few ministers would bring such a lawsuit and uh, I think it w the employer would be successful in the, those situations. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Pat has a question. Uh, I guess uh, carrying on from the last one, what about the payment for clergy? Pat, let me just open up your uh, microphone here. I got to find your microphone. Sorry, one second here. Uh, Pat, there you are. Uh, I'll unmute you. There you go, Pat. So her question, if you want to clarify that, Pat, or. No. So the question is, what about the payment for clergy? Well, that'd be the, the same issue. I think the, you, it has any sort of uh, purely religious <clears throat> occupation, I don't think would be covered by the wage and hour law unless that individual was involved in some kind of commercial activity on a regular basis. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Eric? We're coming up uh, about five more minutes available time to us. Uh, Mike, uh, um, go, oh, let's see who's. Go ahead, whoever was speaking. I'm sorry. So. This is this is Sister Kathy, and I guess my question um, comes based on that that previous question there about clergy. Does that work the same then for religious? For, for what? For, for I religious. Think it's any kind of okay. I was going to say religious. I think it would. Eric, I think you broke up there. I'm not sure. You could just. I think that would, uh, for any position that is purely uh, religious, in, in, I think the, uh, that the wage and hour law would not cover that type of activity. Thank you. Okay, um, question from uh, Mike. To clarify, Let's see, is a layperson campus minister likely to be under ministerial exemption? I think you may have handled that, but yeah, I, I think I, I would. Yeah, I would say yes. Uh, you know, the the issue would pop up if there's some who are employed by these entities who may do things like daycare or other types of activities that that you believe can the private sector. You lose that. Uh, uh, exemption. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? Uh, you can either unmute your microphone or just send me a note on the chat system and I'll pass it on. Just, give it just a moment. Eric, this is Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I have one more question. Is your general counsel or advice that we should talk to our local HR um, point persons in our respective dioceses? Yeah, I think that, that you ought to review these any kind of position that could be 
covered and and make sure that that if necessary changes are made before December one, so that um, you know you minimize the chances of any kind of uh, back wage liability after that. One thing about the wage and hour law is that it's very ripe for lawsuits because there's a provision in the law that allows uh, the plaintiff's attorney to get attorney's fees. <laughs> and often attorney's fees awards far exceed the amount of back wages that are covered. So there's a lot of incentive out there to, to sort of come after uh, employers uh, that don't comply with the wage and hour law. Uh, Eric, I have a question from James. Um, where in the where is the ministerial exemption stated in the Department of Labor regulation? Well, I don't have a site to anything in particular. Uh, the 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 um, the, um, the uh, loss uh, the lawsuit the Supreme Court case that uh, determined what activities of nonprofits can be considered commercial. For coverage under the is under the FLSA is called the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation case. If anybody wants to look at that, very good. Okay, are there any other questions? Can you say that case again. Say that again. What was that? Would you say that again, Eric? Somebody was broken up. I think they want you to repeat the case, please. Oh, Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation is the name of the entity that was found to be covered by the wage and hour law. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? Okay. You can either, un either unmute yourself or just uh, type one in. I'll just give it another moment here, Eric, if you don't mind. So make sure we get all the questions. We really do appreciate your being with us today. and. Uh, shedding light on this uh, this topic. All right, hearing none, um, again, on behalf of C CMA, Eric, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and providing this information. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the uh, those who have joined us today's webinar. In our next webinar, uh, November 16th, features speaker brother Patrick Riley, Brotherhood of Hope, and his discussion on leading a diverse team. So if you're interested, please send an email over to Krista at Bollinger, Bolling, Bollinger B -O -L -I -N -G -E -R, at ccmanet.org. And once again, th thank you, Eric. On behalf of CCMA, uh, Mike St. Pierre, our executive director is online with us, and, uh, and all of you who joined us. Have a great day, and this recording will be available shortly from Krista and the CCMA. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Frank. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.